Welcome to another episode of the Path to Hell podcast, where we discuss the path to hell, what it is, and most importantly, how to avoid it. Where we look into the scriptures for answers. We discuss different topics each week, and this week is kind of a, uh, and uh, it's not a new subject, but it's uh, it's been addressed. It's a very common, popular subject, where we're going to look into what the Word says about drunkenness. What else about sexual immorality, promiscuity, and kind of revolve around that uh, that whole area of what would be considered debauchery or lewdness, as the the Bible calls it. Kind of wrap it up into a modern day partying lifestyle, and a partying lifestyle where that leads, whether you proclaim to be a Christian or not, um, what the Bible says about that lifestyle. And I, and I think it's a popular message that. Um, that's out there as we listen to maybe Christian radio or watch Christian television or hear messages that are given that talk about the love and the grace that Jesus offers us, which is certainly all true. But it also, the, the word, that same word that we go to that tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, and that if we confess with our mouth and we believe in Jesus that we're saved, there's, you know, that word believe has a lot of meaning to it that goes into more of a definition than just believing in something like we believe these chairs were going to hold us up before we sat in it that's one type of belief there's different types of belief so there's different things that go along with that message of grace and love things that on our part not works to earn our way into heaven by any means but expectations that if we do believe that there's a, a reciprocating duty on our part to see what it is we believe in if we say we believe. Yeah, and it's, it's dangerous to isolate a scripture um, like the one you just mentioned, you know, and John 3.16 gets isolated so much. Um, the verse in Romans, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus gets isolated a lot. Uh, when you isolate a scripture and you don't look at the context or the other scriptures that are around it, um, you're really not doing your due diligence as a believer. You know, we're supposed to meditate on the law day and night. Be careful to do everything written in it. Um, uh, Joshua 1.8. And, you know, if, once you dive into the word, you realize it talks a lot more about, you know, sin and righteousness and judgment and, you know, being holy and repentance. Um, a lot more and it talks about, you know, God's grace and, and forgiveness. That's an excellent point. And right now, if we turned on or looked online or went to any current Christian message, those words that you mentioned, sin, judgment, righteousness, hell. repentance, hell, that Jesus talked quite a bit about, that the Word talks quite a bit about, are almost unfindable. Yeah, they're, you know, they're not, they're not seeker-friendly words. You know, people go to church and they feel judged you know that's not that's not a good thing you know we don't judge people as individuals you know and and we shouldn't judge people um but scripture can judge somebody so if you read scripture and it speaks to somebody and they feel judged that's not you that's the holy spirit um speaking to their conscience it's making them feel you know guilty for something that they've done um so to go along with this topic tonight we're going to start in first peter chapter 4 verse 3 um for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Um, so in the scripture, speaking about no longer being a part of worldly things, some of the things that were listed, debauchery, lust, drunkenness, um, idolatry. Uh, we have a great podcast on idolatry. is one of our first ones. Um, but you're no longer involved in those things. You're no longer involved in lust. You're no longer involved in drunkenness. Um, when you're when you're a Christian and you're saved, those things aren't a part of your life anymore. And people are going to think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood, 
meaning you're not doing the same thing that they're doing, people are going to say it's strange. And they heap abuse on you, meaning, you know, they'll, they'll mock you, they'll persecute you for, for not being the same as they are, for not being interested in the same things as they are. You know, they'll, they'll sneer at you thinking you're trying to be better than everybody else. But then, it, conti- then it, 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 it concludes with, but they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So ultimately, you know, this idea of drunkenness and lust and, and this partying lifestyle and, you know, destroying your body with, with, with drugs and alcohol, um, it's not a part of a Christian's lifestyle. You know, and I want to be, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about this early, um, but the Bible does not condemn drinking. And anyone who says it does, I think, is really misconstruing Scripture. Um, I think that we both agree, and anyone that can read the Scriptures, you know, Jesus gave wine at the feast, you know, and there's arguments of whether that wine had alcohol content. There's been tons of studies. It absolutely had alcohol in it. It was fermented. Um, the Bible does not specifically condemn drinking. Um, but Especially the way that, that that sequence is described of saving the, the best wine, serving the best wine first and saving the non not as good wine for later on definitely goes in and 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 reinforces the fact that that wine was alcoholic yeah so we are not condemning drinking um but the bible absolutely on i think probably more than a dozen occasions specifically condemns drunkenness now that's being drunk well what is being drunk being drunk would be not being in the right state of mind. I think uh, the United States has dialed it down to 0.08. I'd say that's probably pretty close to being accurate. More than two drinks an hour is probably drunk. Um, drinking for the intention to get a buzz or to feel, you know, you know, to, to just get out of your mind for a little bit and go to a different place, that would be being drunk. It's such a fine line that as a believer you need to be, if you choose to drink, which I think it's fine if you don't drink, and Paul talks about that, not causing someone else to stumble, you know, if they don't drink, you know, don't drink around them, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it's a very fine line that as a believer you have to choose to be very, very careful if you choose to drink where that line is and, you know, pray about it. and. And for me, it's such a fine line. I just tend to just avoid the whole thing because it's it's scary to really think about, you know, what what where's that line of being drunk? Because obviously it's important because it's mentioned so much. Well, that's a great point because, you know, I don't want to come off in this podcast as not having experience in whether it's the, the drinking or the drunkenness because I'm, you know, I, any opinions I give are coming from experience myself. Certainly, we don't get on here and claim to be um perfect in any way so definitely there's a fine line between drinking and being drunk and i think that that's why it's it's talked about and mentioned so much in the in the scripture and in the bible so you know that's something that you're really flirting with yeah of those those things that you read there in first peter that whole list of things to avoid and and become away from you know if you use like hate or murder as an example well you're you know you're really rarely flirting with you know holding a knife up to somebody and there's a chance that you could kill Kill somebody but if you've got a bottle in front of you and you're you know that one more drink can push you over the edge i think that that's one of the most delicate uh sins i guess that the bible talks about on Hey, things can really go one way or another, or swing one way or the other, or, or people that that feel like that that alcohol may have a hold over them to some degree. Where you, you know, you've heard not to use the term alcoholic or whatever, but somebody that maybe has to have a drink every day, or you know, I'm so nervous, I I need a drink. You know, kind of stop and examine whether that's something that has a hold on you or not and the whole legality of alcohol you know go back to the old prohibition days where they tried to just outlaw alcohol obviously because it was a big causer of problems in society that didn't go off very well didn't work might have made things worse arguably in one way or another but there's a lot of problems in the world a lot of problems I've seen in my own life and in people I know's life and locally and regionally and nationally and worldwide actually that involve alcohol Mm -hmm. you know I think alcohol can lead to so many other things 
they talk about gateway drugs of getting involved in other things and the type of uh, depressant that alcohol is, the effect that it has on your brain that can lead into pill popping or any of that kind of thing. And I don't know, but it's definitely a slippery slope. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 7, um, Paul's telling the Thessalonians here in this letter, he says, there, verses, I'm going to read verses 6 and 7 out of chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. He says, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. You know, again, he's not talking about drinking per se, necessarily. Matter of fact, I think the Bible even talks about Paul tells Timothy to take a little wine for your stomach's sake or whatever medicinal purposes. But here he's saying, those who get drunk, get drunk at night. And think of all the other things that happen at night. You know, what, what getting drunk at night can lead to, the promiscuity, the sexual immorality, the things that a lot of times go hand in hand with drunkenness, violence, fighting. You know, the, the bars and the, and the nightclubs are open till the wee hours of the morning, you yeah. know, so that people can get up and, and head out to start drinking to get drunk at, you know, drunk driving accidents, another example. DUIs, usually DUIs at night. At night, you know, you're drinking at night. So drunkenness is such a fine line. Then how about the argument that probably myself even guilty of in the past? Well, I'm not really drunk. Yeah. You know, or I have to drink a lot to get drunk. To drink a lot to get drunk. And certainly there's differences in metabolisms. You know, a 100 pound girl versus a 300 pound man can metabolize the alcohol in their systems at different levels. But, you know, inside, you know, whether you're inebriated or not, or whether your judgment has been affected, or whether your, your senses have been dulled, or whether your inhibitions have been removed. There's lots of things that go along with that and, and crossing all, that fine line of drunkenness. Ultimately, you can fool somebody by saying that, but what that person thinks really doesn't matter. You know, if you've crossed that line, Good point. you know, the Lord knows, and that's what we're judged on. But, you know, for me, it's almost like someone that has an understanding of how holy God is and, and, and what judgment means would never even try to come anywhere close to that line. They would just understand that, you know, it's not something you're supposed to do, and it just is what it is. And, and if drunkenness, say, is something that you struggle with, why tempt yourself and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay, I'll be fine, I'll just have a few drinks. You know, why not just say, well, hey, I'm, I'm just not going to drink because that's, that's an issue for me yeah. that I know that, you know, a lot of times it's, it's the Bible tells us and lumps in that category of things that we should be self-controlled. You know, Paul talks about that several places. In the book of Titus, he tells us to be self-controlled and godly. You know, so why put a, put yourself in a position where one drink or two drinks are going to maybe have you have that struggle internally to have the third, fourth, or fifth drink? And, you know, if you're drinking alcohol every day because it's something you need, but you're not praying every day or reading your Bible every day, but you still say you're a Christian. I mean, it just it doesn't line up with the Word of God and what it says. I mean, it's it's not possible. Yeah, that uh, that fruit of self control can go a long way in this particular subject that we're talking about tonight with yeah. with drunkenness. And and think about what about the what about the image if we're you know for those of you that are watching this podcast and and you know consider yourself to be a Christian or Christ like. What, a, what, a, what damage that does to your testimony to other Christians or non-Christians alike to be in a state of drunkenness. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, there's, no, there's no way to really justify that under any circumstances, I don't think. It's, it's shocking how many people you'll meet that are Christians that, you know, like the bar scene, like the partying scene, like to go out and get drunk and then, you know, go talk to somebody and pray for them. And, you know, they act like everything's good and they love God so much, but they're, you know, at this bar every Friday night getting drunk. That's, that's not, that's, that's so far from Scripture and what it says, and it's so hypocritical that it does so much more damage than it does good for the kingdom when we're called to be holy and to separate ourselves from sin and to repent and to turn away from sin. 
and that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That's what it says in the scripture. I mean, how much more friendly with the world can you get than, than pulling up a chair next to him and getting drunk at a bar? I mean, you look just like the world. We're supposed to be separate from the world. The world's actually supposed to hate us for, what, for how we are. There's supposed to be such a separation between Christians and the world, the world being the world that's ran by the devil, that it should be, you know, almost like animosity. It should almost be like, oh, wow, like this is... This is, you know, we're in opposition of each other. Like we're, we're, we're totally different than you. We're a different tribe of people than you. Um, and that all goes out the window the second that, that you know, you decide that drinking is a part of your life. And think about it this way, too, for a minute as we talk about, you know, the bar scene or culture in general. And think of how big a part alcohol plays in, in cultures and societies around the world. You know, if you look at, you know, it, it, Italy and France and Germany where alcohol plays a big part in their in their culture in their meal you know in, in Germany you could drink a beer for breakfast you know Italians you know wine with dinner it's a it's a part of their culture but not necessarily everybody that's doing that is partaking in the drunkenness part of it or pushing it there's certainly probably a percentage that are yeah. So, you know, just because we're in America and, you know, alcohol went from illegal to legal and we can buy it and you turn, oh, you turn 21 and now you can go drink, you know, that doesn't absolve us from what the word tells us about being drunk just because it's legal, because everybody else is doing it, because uh, uh, you can, because you reached a certain age, you know, there's still our, our conscience and our accountability that you were talking about earlier that we still have to answer for has nothing to do with whether or not something's legal or everybody's doing it. We have to, we have to examine ourselves Absolutely. as the word tells us. Yeah. You know, Jesus uses an example here as in one of his parables when he's talking about the faithful servant and the evil servant. And I won't, um, I won't go through the whole parable, but in Luke chapter 12, verse 45 he's kind of wrapping this up about the evil servant he says in his heart my master is delaying his coming and he begins now these are the bad qualities of the evil servant that Jesus is listing here my master is delaying his coming and he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and to be drunk so here here Jesus is painting a picture of of a servant that's not um, doing his part with the, the responsibilities given to him by his master, and one of them is by being drunk. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a big separation, too, because the Bible talks about, you know, uh, at the Last Supper, you know, they had wine. Um, and, you know, Jesus turned the wine, water into wine at the feast. I mean, there, there's separations between drinking and getting drunk. And drunk, being drunk is specifically condemned over and over and over again. Yeah. But yet drinking seems like something, you know, that not only Jesus did, but the disciples did. And other, you know, people that were obviously believers that wrote books of the, the New Testament did. Um, Peter being one of them. So, I mean, um, it's, a, it's a line that is so bizarre how it got crossed to where there's a thing now where, you know, someone that just loves alcohol and gets drunk all the time is just totally soundly saved in their opinion even though it's it's a sin that's specifically condemned you know over and over again you know in a, in a quick search on just being drunk and that subject biblically you know the old testament is full of problems with drunkenness yeah and and much like the new testament so we're talking we're talked to about it and the subject is addressed quite a bit in the scriptures. And it always causes problems. Nothing good ever comes out of it. Your body actually has problems when you get drunk. You have a headache. You know, you throw up. You, you're drowsy. You're tired. You lose your motor skills. You know, your body reacts because you're created and your creation is not made for that. It's not made to be drunk. So bad that a lot of times you promise you'll never do it again. Yeah. Because the effects I'll are so bad. I'll never do this again. It's I'll so bad. I'll never do this again. It's so bad. I'm never drinking again. Never drinking again. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a tough subject, but I don't think it's something that should be taken lightly. I mean, we're exposed to alcohol every day. What happens when we go in and sit down in a restaurant to eat? 
you know, the waitress, the first thing is... Like is a margarita or an ice special is light. the margaritas. Yeah. Or the, you know, the, so, I mean, it, it's around us. It's there. But the, the self-control, that fruit of self-control has to come into play in a Christian's life to either say no thank you or to know to have one or whatever the limits are to to not even come close to approaching that line of drunkenness. You know, and, and we're told also in the Bible, it tells us, you know, to, to stay away from even the appearance of evil. Yeah. You know, so if there's if you're going to offend your, your brother by having a, a cocktail or a drink in front of them, you know, that's an appearance of evil. Yeah, or, you know, you're trying to witness to somebody and they see you at a bar drinking. They're like, oh, well, drinking must be fine, you know? I mean, it's just not a good look for anything. Yeah. There's nothing good that can really come from it, you know? And if that's true, then... You know, let's not let's not press our luck, you know, and I'm not saying don't I don't think you should ever drink because it's not Christian like what I am saying is that it's it's such a fine line, it needs to be treated so gently, realizing what it is. There's a lot of subjects we tackle in the in the different um, podcasts that we do, but you know, Second Corinthians chapter five, we've used this verse before. But just as a reminder, because this definitely falls into the same category. We're told that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us. That one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Well, if we're if we're forbidden from being drunk, which, you know, again, you like to bring up a lot in our episodes of the Ten Commandments for say, well, all these Ten Commandments, what's what's bad about keeping the Ten Commandments. Yeah, you know, which one of those do you can't, yeah. can't help but not do? Right, which one of those is good to do the opposite of? So, I mean, what what possible good comes out of being drunk except leading into some of the other things that you mentioned earlier? So we all must give an account for what we've done. And we're also told, First Peter chapter 1 tells us to be holy. Yeah, we're actually supposed to be holy. Be holy. So how how is it being holy to be drunk? That's that, that's not holy There's, at all. You can't match those two up at you all. You know, or buzzed. You know, or to be like right there on the edge. It's not being holy. You know, for for anyone that has questions about this, you know, and you might be thinking, well, you know, I I still don't believe all that. You know, I haven't heard anything where the Bible, you know, specifically condemns that. Well, let me let me clear it up for you. Um, in Galatians chapter five, verse nineteen, it says that. Um, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, usually partying, you know, I mean, premarital sex, sex with somebody, it usually happens from a partying lifestyle. Lusting. Lusting. Impurity, it's usually from a, a lifestyle like that or doing those things. Debauchery, certainly a lifestyle like that. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, Jealousies, fits of rage, hatred, discord, jealousies, and fits of rage is often a side effect of being drunk. Sure. You've heard people say, well, we got to stay away from that guy when yeah. he starts drinking. When he gets on that tequila, man, he goes crazy. Yeah, right. Or he drinks whiskey. You don't want to be around him. Yeah. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, and orgies. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Envy drunkenness. I warn you like I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. There will be with the liars, the idolaters, um, the, the, the people that are jealous, that have hate in their hearts. The, they'll be cast in the lake of fire. Just like it's, we're told in Revelation, there's no place for them in the kingdom of God. Because they did not repent. They did not turn away from sins. They were, they were held up by the world. In uh, chapter 16 it says, So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You're not living by the spirit if you're gratifying desires of the sinful nature. You're living by the flesh. For the sinful na nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit desires what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want to do. So, you know, your flesh is desiring to get drunk. It's desiring to have sex with anyone that you can find. It's desiring to live this impure lifestyle because our flesh is wicked. But if we're walking in the spirit, we do contrary to what we want to do, to what our flesh does. So if you're not doing contrary to that and you're doing what's, what's lined up with that, then you're walking by the flesh. And at the end of uh, 
chapter 21, it says, verse 21. verse 21, it says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's laid out very clearly, and there is no, uh, there, there cannot be an argument for anyone who claims to be a Christian or lives by the Bible or obeys, you know, Jesus' commands or believes that God's word is holy and God breathed, that there's a place in your life for drunkenness, because there isn't. You know, as you're reading that, just kind of re-examining the magnitude of that statement, that that those things that you listed that included drunkenness, people who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, you know, by saying, oh, there's old Joe again, he's, he's drunk again, well, from the Bible, we could actually say, well, there's old Joe again. There's, there's a fellow that's not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, call it out for exactly what it is. Inter interchangeable. You know, so you know, as we're listening to this, it kind of glazes over your mind. It's like, ah, there's nothing wrong with just getting drunk every once in a while. Well, what if that happens? You know, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. What if in the middle of being drunk, because of the effect that alcohol has on your body, your ticker decides to give out or you have some kind of a stroke or, or beyond you... that if you've never truly repented from the lifestyle of getting drunk you could go three or four days without drinking just because you haven't done it not because you've repented just because you've time got... and then if doesn't... you if you die jesus isn't going to be like oh he went 72 hours without drinking he's good to go no he knows that you were you know getting ready to fire it back up you had not truly repented there was no godly contrition towards your lifestyle yeah i mean he and you would not inherit the kingdom of god drunkenness is not a one-time thing drunkenness is a lifestyle of drunkenness whether it's once a month because it doesn't say envy those who have ever been drunk or it says drunkenness, drunkenness. you just you just enjoy drunkenness you enjoy drinking to a point to where you're you're out of your normal mind your your mindset that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So just because you know, you, you're know you not drunk at the time that you die and you pass into eternity, that doesn't save you. You can't just say, well, hopefully I don't die in the next six hours before I sober up. No, if you live that lifestyle, there's no godly contrition. You know, you, you haven't chosen to turn away from that sin, from all your sin, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And and think about that. And think about our, you know, the, the culture that we live in where you know, you hear some people say, well, I'm not that bad of a person. I've never killed anybody or, you know, whatever. Well, you know, as far as the Bible tells us and as far as eternity is concerned, drunkenness will disallow someone from inheriting the kingdom of God. I mean, that should just be more than enough right there. Something that's, that's, that's almost made a joke about now or laughed about or... You know, if you watch television, it's a, it's almost a funny subject. Or you go to work and somebody says, oh, man, you know, I, I'm just now getting back to work. I, I was drinking all weekend. We went to a party. You know, and generally, too, I have a hard time believing that a Christian or someone that's soundly saved, that their only sin that they're holding on to is drunkenness. You know, there's probably other stuff that goes along with that. You know, gossip, lust some kind of, you know, otherworldly thing that's attached to that. I doubt there's someone that's just a complete saint that reads their Bible every day that just enjoys just getting drunk at night. But envy? Yeah, envy. Think of how, think of how envy and being envious isn't thought of in that same manner as drunkenness that's put on the same level as idolatry, witchcraft, witchcraft. You know, those are those are all lumped into the same category. And, and sexual immorality, which is almost a, is hand in hand with drunkenness. I mean, you know, one night stands and you know lust and 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 all these sexual things always coincide with drunkenness. It seems like, or certainly it 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 ramps up the likelihood of something happening. Being drunk. Well, sure. If you think about stories you've heard of of adultery and relationships or marriages or problems and, and along the, the sexual immorality lines, almost all of them have been tied in with some kind with of partying lifestyle. Partying lifestyle to some degree. You know, in, in um, I wanted to read in Romans chapter 13 verse 13. You know, 
Paul's telling a different church. We read Thessalonians. We talked about Titus. Now we're in Romans, a different letter to a different church. Paul says in chapter 13, he says, let us walk properly as in the day. Again, back to that day and night differentiation there. Paul says, let us walk properly as in the day. Another translation of that word is decently not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. So, you know, the, the, the couple, first two things that he lists there that he's telling the church in Rome, let us walk decently as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness. You know, revelry and drunkenness, envy, he's putting in lewdness and lust, all in the same kind of category. You know, they're all kind of lumped in with that drunkenness like you were reading earlier. Let us walk properly. Be holy, we're told in Peter. Walk decently. Yeah, and Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. You know, we're commanded to, to be different, to be set apart. And part of that being set apart, you know, sexual immorality, lust, drunkenness, I mean, there's no place for it in a Christian's life. And I know this is starting to... You know sound redundant um, but I've met way too many people just in my life and you know I don't have like a ton of friends and people that I'm around that think that they're you know gonna die and go to heaven and if you look at the fruit of their life it's totally contrary to the scripture you know and and that cell that 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 feeling of being you know soundly saved and safe in your salvation comes from the devil when you are living that lifestyle you know the bible tells us so many times to examine ourselves test yourselves yeah. um and not in, in i think three different occasions paul mentions it um you know we're supposed to do that look at our lives live not not just by our minds but with with knowledge of scripture too right you know, crack open the bible anywhere in the new testament read five chapters one way or another and you'll have something to examine your life with you know whether especially if it's in you know any of the epistles I mean, you can look at that and be like, oh, wow, you know, imagine reading Galatians 5 and saying, you know, the acts of sinful nature, obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness. Wow, not going to inherit the kingdom of God if I have any of those things? As I warn you guys did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God? Yeah, and... It, it certainly, even though it might sound monotonous or it might sound like a broken record, it's, I mean, this is very serious business. Yeah, we're, we're we're we live in America, we you know we're in the United States. We've got laws, we've got culture, we've got what people tell us, we've got even what Christian messages tell us. But you know we're we're reading from the Word here that tells us again in Colossians. So here's another letter from Paul. You know, be holy. We're told in Peter, Paul said, walk decently as in the day. Now here he's telling in this letter, Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read a couple verses, 21, 22. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. You described some of those wicked works earlier. Yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh talking about Jesus through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard so we're you know he's telling us here that we're presented blameless and holy through what Jesus has done but before we were alienated and em enemies in our mind by wicked works, but now we've been reconciled. So that's why we can no longer continue in envy and orgies and drunkenness and idolatry and all of those things that are listed. So it's very serious business that we're talking about because the Bible says that we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And honestly, you know, it would be a lot better off and you would be doing a, a, a favor for for true Christians if you stopped claiming to be a Christian and you were doing those things if you like to drink go with all the drunkards if you like to lust go with all the prostitutes but don't 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 be a part of that 
separate tribe of people, of Christians, and live that life of sin because you're just going to bring more false converts with you that think they're safe in their salvation because they live this filthy, sinful lifestyle and they claim to be a Christian because they've seen what you did and it's infectious and it goes around and a little leaven um, works through the whole batch, um, as, as the Bible says in Galatians. So, I mean, it's it's that works both ways. It has to, there has to be a separation. And for you to claim to be a Christian and be doing that stuff, you're just, you're just creating more problems for true Christians that are actually trying to go make disciples of all nations. Disciples, you know, discipline, that's what, that's what that word comes from. Discipline to follow God's commands, to know that we're supposed to crucify the flesh and be separate from those desires and to, to walk in the spirit and live by the spirit, which is contrary to what the flesh desires. So, I mean, we're certainly not wanting you to take our word for something or our opinion. We're not telling, we're, we're, we're flavoring things a little bit with what we think and maybe with some examples, but we're, we're reading scripture and we're going with what the Bible says. Imagine again, and we've talked about this before, you know, if there's a heaven and a hell and there's a God and there's angels and there's demons and there's devils. Well, what if, what if the devil and his plan to 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 cloud the minds or to interfere with someone's christian walk somehow is able to get someone to think that well god's not going to mind this or this will be okay this time well i'm good in these areas but these areas i'll, I'll kind of i'm okay if god will understand in this situation you know i mean that's a that's a deception and yeah. we're warned over and over in the bible especially in the New Testament, especially from Jesus, not to be deceived. You know, we shouldn't be deceived. We don't want to be deceived by the deceiver. Yeah. Into, into our own minds, we're supposed to examine ourselves. We're not even really supposed to trust ourselves, the Bible tells us, to look and see what the Scripture tells us. Now, I'm going to read the red letters, Jesus' words in Luke. After we're talking about not being deceived, not having our own ideas of what's okay and what's not okay, we weigh it against the scriptures. Now, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 21, I'm going to read just one verse, verse 34. Well, I'm going to read two verses, 34 and 35. Jesus tells us, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So Jesus specifically listing three things to be not be weighed down with and to take heed to ourselves that we're not weighed down with carousing. And another translation or word for that is dissipation, drunkenness, and the cares of the life, of this life, that that day will come on us unexpectedly. Those are pretty sobering words. And Jesus is talking specifically about drunkenness. Yeah. And I mean, it, there's been so many points we've just made in, in scriptures just now about, you know, drunkenness and, and what that'll lead to. I think that drunkenness, just like many other sins, like, you know, pornography and things that are more modern day have been so watered down to not seem like that big of a deal and shame on churches too because they make people feel comfortable in their sins thinking that you know Jesus is just this big that his sacrifice was so perfect that it covers you know every sin ever committed and there's really no need for repentance as long as you just kind of feel sorry for what you did then that's enough repentance but other than that you don't really have to change your lifestyle you know as long as you just kind of feel sorry Shame on churches for doing that, and you know that's that's one of the biggest heresies ever. Is this 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 hyper grace message that's going around, and not realizing that we've sinned against the holy God, and that we need to repent and turn away from our sins. Um, I think that as far as the the lack of preaching the law, and you know using the law to convert the soul, um, has it, gotten so far away that there's a lot of people that that are Christians that are totally comfortable in their sin now, and drunkenness is just one of them. I don't know if it's the most common, but it's certainly out there because I've seen it firsthand with my own eyes. People that are born-again Christians that just 
being drunk is almost a part of their lifestyle. Certainly, certainly partying is, you know, it's not like they just sit at home and drink themselves to sleep every night, although there are some of those that do that too. I agree. But, you know, lots of people that are more my age, you know, just in that partying lifestyle, but in their mind, they're, you know, totally soundly saved. Yeah, and, and again, I go back to the, the fact that, you know, because of our culture, and it's so accepted, and it's such a part of our culture, that it's really not that big a deal. Yeah. You know, you're... You're almost, I mean, as, as far as the world's concerned, you're almost kind of bragging when you talk about how much you drank the night before. Yeah. Or you should have seen so-and-so the other night. He couldn't even stand up straight. Or you're like a weirdo if you don't drink. It's like, what do you mean? Like, you don't drink at all? No, I don't drink at all. Well, that's weird. That sucks. Stand out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, in Colossians 3, 5... You know, we're told, Paul says that he's been crucified with Christ. That it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And before I read this verse, you know, you'd mentioned earlier about, you know, your flesh wanting to, to do this and do that. All these things that are listed sounds good. And the Bible tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. You know, it's not that the, the, the drunkenness, sexual immorality, and the things that we've talked about here, the debauchery, the orgies and all that, that it's not pleasurable. But if we're truly born again and we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, you know, there's a big discrepancy from these things that we're talking about and drunkenness in particular that we're tackling tonight specifically that doesn't line up with, with someone that's spirit-filled, born again, crucified the flesh, not living in the flesh, but being led by the spirit Colossians 3 5 Paul says therefore put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire covetousness which is idolatry because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience now he doesn't mention drunkenness specifically there but evil desires idolatry some could argue drunkenness is idolatry because you're, you know, you're feeding your own self and your own desires to get to the point where you're inebriated and you've lost your, your, your natural physical faculties. Or you're serving a God that's okay with being drunk when really God is not okay with it, Good as, point. as Jesus mentioned even. So, I mean, it's, so you're really an idolater because you're serving a God that doesn't exist. Right. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So we don't want to be a son of disobedience or a daughter of disobedience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good way to end this podcast. Um, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe and hit that thumbs up. And we'll see you next week.